so thank you, Rachel, for the um, introduction, and thanks to all the organizers for the invitation. Um, I really got a lot out of the Arizona Winter School when I was a graduate student, so I hope uh, you will all enjoy this as well. Um, and I haven't written on one of these document cameras before, so if you can't see something, just shout. All right, so as Rachel said, the title of my lecture series is, is that big enough? Maybe bigger. Rational points on surfaces. So the question that I want to consider is given a global field K and a K variety X, how do we determine if X has a K rational point? So if X of K is non-empty. Okay, so um, in my lectures, what I want to do is give you an overview of the types of tools we have to address this problem. And then I'll focus, particularly in the case when X is a surface, and tell you what our known results are in that case and um, what our expectations are, what the conjectural picture is for how we approach this problem when X is a surface. And then in my last two lectures, what I'm going to focus on is a particular example. So the beginning will give you the theory behind the tools, but then once we have them, how do you actually compute them given a particular surface with equations? What do we do to carry it out? Okay, so even though the title is Rational Points on Surfaces, I won't get to surfaces for a little while, but they will come. Okay, so let me begin um, before introducing some of the theory. Let me begin with an example. So this example is due to Lyndon Reichart. And it's the first interesting example of a variety that fails to have a k-rational point. Okay, so uh, this is going to be a curve. So we can think of it in two ways. We can either think of it as given by the equation 2y squared equals x to the fourth minus 17z to the fourth in weighted projective space where x and z have weight 1 and y has weight 2. Or equivalently, you can think of it as the intersection of two quadrics in P3. Make sure I don't mess up my variable name. Okay, and to go back and forth, capital Z corresponds to little z, capital X corresponds to little x, and capital Y corresponds to YZ. Okay, so why do I say this is the first interesting example? Oh, and this we're considering this over Q. So there is one, well, okay, many ways that you can uh, write down a variety that fails to have a rational point. For instance, you can write down a variety that fails to have a real point, or also that fails to have a piatic point for every P. So I claim that this is the first interesting example because it, it's not for any of those reasons. So let's first uh, check that this is indeed interesting for my definition of interesting. So uh, we want to prove that this has a real point and a QP point for all P. Okay, well, uh, the real point is, this is clear. For instance, you can just, you know, well, you can pick your favorite real point. There's many you can choose. I think you all believe me that there is a real point. Okay, so how are we going to deal with the QP points for every P? So for a particular prime, you could all probably find a point yourself by playing around for long enough. But I don't really want to consider each prime one at a time. That would make for a very boring lecture series. <laughs> so 
we're going to try to figure out a way to deal with all primes, well, all but finitely many primes at once. Okay, and the way we do that is, so if p is not equal to 2 or 17, then if I just take these equations and reduce them mod p, c over fp is smooth. And by Hensel's lemma, we know that if you have an fp point on a smooth curve, then you can lift it to a qp point. Well, really on a smooth variety. Okay, so we can instead, for all p not equal to 2 or 17, we can instead try to ask if the curve has an fp point. Okay, so that's um, easier to check than qp, but I still have infinitely many conditions. So what am I going to do? Well, the vague conjectures for curves, which was proved by Ve himself, that tells me, oh, maybe I should just write on another page. Okay. So the vague conjectures for curves say that if C is uh, a smooth curve of genus G, and C over FP is smooth, so let's say we're over Q. I mean, this is more general, but this is what I'll say for now, is smooth, then the number of points, FP points, is greater than or equal to uh, P minus 2 G times square root of P plus 1. Okay? In this case, this curve, well, you can look at it two ways. One, it's a double cover of P1 ramified at four points, or it's an intersection of two quadrics in P3. Either one of those ways tell you that this is a genus 1 curve. So for this example, the number of FP points is greater than or equal to uh, P minus, wait, square root of P minus 1 squared. I think that works out. Yes. And that's always positive for any P. Okay, so now I've dealt with all the primes in one fell L swoop except for 2 and 17. And so you can just check by hand that you have a Q2 point and that you have a Q17 point. Okay, so in my notes I write down a particular example, but now we have finitely many ones, we can just check. It's not no longer going to be a so hopefully no longer going to be a boring lecture series. So dealt with all of the P uh, at once except for these two. Okay, so now this curve is an interesting, uh, it doesn't fail to have rational points for a boring reason. So now we want to claim that actually it also has no rational points. Okay, so how can we do this? Well, I'm going to work with the model and weighted projective space. So let's assume that there is a solution. So by scaling, I may assume that all of the coordinates are integers and pairwise relatively prime. So you have to be a little bit careful with this argument because we're in weighted projective space, so it's not as immediate as it is um, in regular projective space, but for this example it still works. Okay, so uh, let's let P be a prime dividing Y naught, which is odd. Okay, so then, yes? Oh, uh, yes, sorry, is empty. Thank you. 
<laughs> yes, I get a little too happy with my slashes. Okay, so if um, p divides y naught and p is an odd prime, then if we look at this equation, since x, y, and z are pairwise relatively prime integers, that tells you that 17, well, it tells you that 17 is a, uh, a fourth power mod p, but in particular, it tells you that it's a square mod p, because p doesn't divide x and y. So 17 is a square mod p. And since 17 is 1 mod 4 by quadratic reciprocity, that tells us that p is a square mod 17. OK? So that takes care of all the odd primes dividing uh, y naught. So y naught is some product of odd primes, all of which are a square mod p, and then times maybe plus or minus, and times some power of 2. But 17 is also not just 1 mod 4, it's 1 mod 8. Uh, 2 is a square mod 17, and minus 1 is a square mod 17. So if you know for all odd primes, it's a dividing y naught is a square mod 17, and for 2 and minus 1, that tells you that y naught is actually a square mod 17. And if you plug that into the equation, that's going to tell you that 2 y naught to the fourth is congruent to x naught to the fourth mod 17. So you get that 2 is a fourth power mod 17. But the fourth powers, fourth powers mod 17 are 1, minus 1, 4, and minus 4. In particular, not 2. So we get, we get a contradiction that this, uh, you couldn't possibly have had a rational point because otherwise you'd have 2 as a fourth power mod 17, which is blatantly false. Okay, so this is a very nice argument. I mean, it's the first example that was ever given where we had an example of this kind where you had local solutions but no global solution. But it's a little mysterious. You don't really see where this came from. How do we, why did we start with the primes dividing y? What if we started with the primes dividing x? Like if I change this 17 to a 19, does it still fail to have solutions? Like what is going on? It's very hard to see what's going on. So where's the key step in this argument? The key step is when we did quadratic reciprocity, right? Everything else is a local argument. I was just saying, okay, well, if p divides this, then 17 is a square mod p. That's telling me something about the um, the solutions. Uh, yeah, in every other part of the argument, I'm just working mod one prime at a time. But then quadratic reciprocity is the step where I'm allowed to switch from taking information mod 1 prime and considering it mod another prime. That's the magic part of the proof. So what we want to do is try to rephrase quadratic reciprocity in a way that makes it more, I don't want to say obvious, but um, easier to generalize to other varieties. Quadratic reciprocity has nothing to do with any varieties. So how do we know when it can be used for a particular curve or not? What we want to do is a rephrasing of it so it makes it clear how this argument depends on the particular variety. Okay? So that's, that's our goal, is to develop some theory which... Uh, yeah, allows us to do this. Okay, so how are we going to do this? Well, we're going to do this with the Brouwer group. 
probably not surprising to anyone who's looked at any uh, number of the lecture notes. <laughs> so I'm going to focus on the bar group of a field and then uh, so K will just be any field, no assumption on it right now. Okay, then the Brouwer group of K, well, this is the set of central simple algebras. And then I mod out uh, by Brouwer equivalence. So I say that A is Brouwer equivalent to B if the n by n matrices over A are isomorphic to the m by m matrices over B for some m, n and m. And this actually forms a group under tensor product. Okay? And then it is a theorem that this is isomorphic to uh, H2 of the absolute Galois group acting on the units of the separable closure. This is Galois cohomology. Okay, so that's the definition of the Brouwer group. Uh, so let's see some examples of what it is. So in some cases, it can be very simple. So if K is finite, so if it's very small, or if it's very big, or if K is algebraically closed, then the Brouwer group is very boring. It's the identity. Okay, so what are some examples of non-trivial elements of the Brouwer group? Well, another example we know is that the Brouwer group of R So what's an element inside of here? Well, we want a central simple R algebra. So one thing that probably everyone has seen is that we can take the Hamiltonian quaternions. So we can take R, Rxm Ri, Rxm Rj, Rxm R. And I'm just going to write Ij because K is my field, where I squared equals minus 1 equals J squared, and J times I equals minus I. Okay, so that is a central simple R algebra, and it is not isomorphic to a matrix algebra because it's a division ring. And you can show that this actually generates the Brouwer group of R. This is the only non trivial element. It's isomorphic to ZMF2. Okay, so that's an example of something in the Brouwer group. And if you look at this example and you try to you go through the proof, proving that it's central and simple, you realize that there's a lot that can be stated more generally. So instead of taking this over R and setting I squared and J squared to be minus one, we can work over any field K. So we can take two non-zero elements, and then we can consider the quaternion algebra of A, B over K, which I'll denote a comma B sub minus one, um, and by the end I should make it clear why that's why I chose to put a minus one. Okay, then I just do the exact same definition, and now it's really important that I just used I and J, and I take instead of doing minus one, I take I squared to be A, J squared to be E, B, and I and J anti-commute again. Okay, and that's. The minus one is coming from here. It's telling you how you move across the i and the j. Okay, so this, uh, for any a and b units in your field, oh, and the characteristic, I need the characteristic of k not to be two, then this is a central simple algebra over k. So it defines an element in the Brouwer group. And for my, uh, all my lectures, I will uh, conflate the algebra with its class in the Brouwer group. Okay, so whenever I write this down, I am thinking of this algebra, but really I'm thinking of it mod this equivalence. 
Okay, so what you can show is that uh, as long as your characteristic is not true for any A and B, this is a true torsion element in the Brouwer group of K. And this is equal to the identity in the Brouwer group if and only if uh, there exists a non-trivial solution to the equation ax squared plus by squared equals z squared over k. So you want the solution over k. Yes? Um, it is the same as Morita equivalence when you're looking over spec k. Other questions? Okay. So this Brouwer class being trivial is exactly the same as this conic having a rational point. And so what this should suggest to you is that in general, um, computations in the Brouwer group are difficult. Because if K is some arbitrary field, how on earth do we determine whether or not this has a solution? Okay, so this is an example of a true torsion element uh, when the characteristic is not equal to two. But what about examples when we have characteristic two or for higher torsion elements? The Brouwer group is already interesting even if you just consider two torsion elements. Of course, it would be more interesting if we can understand elements beyond that. So, or if there, so there are, something here. Okay. There are interesting classes beyond that. So, Okay, so if K is an arbitrary field, so no assumption on the characteristic again. Now we can let L over K be a cyclic extension of degree N and fix a generator of the Galois group. Okay, so then we can define something called a cyclic algebra. So this is going to be, I take the polynomial ring in uh, over L, but not the regular polynomial ring, skew polynomial ring. So I have to tell you how you move an element of L to the other side of your variable. So the way we do this is we just act by sigma, do this for all elements of L. And then we take this skew polynomial ring and we quotient by y to the n minus t. Okay. So then the claim is that this for any for any b a unit in K, and for any cyclic extension in any generator, this algebra is a central simple algebra over K. And it's what's called split by L. So it's in the kernel if you take the map from Brouwer K to Brouwer L. So we just tensor all of our algebras with L. Now it's a central simple L algebra, and this will always be trivial when you base change to L. Okay, so the, um, the central simple algebra part is not so bad. Proving that it splits is more difficult. You actually have to give an isomorphism, right? Okay, or we can use cohomological arguments. But this part is a little harder. This part is easier. 
but I'm not going to prove either part. I'm going to leave it to you. OK. And we also know um, Well, this element has order at most n. So something really, really nice happens when you consider cyclic algebras for fixed cyclic extension. So in general, the Brouwer group is pretty hard to work with. When we tensor some of these algebras together, it's not clear what happens. Do they become trivial? Do they, are they, again, a division algebra? Do you need to mod out by this Brouwer equivalence to get a division algebra? what's happening. So even though this is a group, um, almost for all intents and purposes, we can't actually physically add things. We know that there is a central simple algebra, which is the sum of it. But to write it as a division algebra or you know, simplify it in any way is usually pretty hard. But if you consider, um, these types of algebras for fixed extension L, then we actually know how to do the group operation. So this is a pretty amazing theorem. So if you have a cyclic extension and you fix a generator, I guess I don't need to write this again, but it's already started. OK. And I'm going to let the kernel of this map, this is called the relative Brouwer group, Brouwer L over K. So then the relative Brouwer group is isomorphic to take the elements of K star and mod out by the norms coming from L. And it's not just that there is some abstract isomorphism. The isomorphism is very nice. You take an element B and you send it to the cyclic algebra sigma B. Okay. So for cyclic algebras for the that are cyclic for the same extension, we actually know how to combine things and work with the Brouwer equivalence very nicely. This is like one of the very few cases where this actually happens. It's kind of amazing, actually very amazing. Um, so in particular, you get a condition very similar to what we had over here, which is that really need to write this as a corollary, but I'm going to anyway. This is trivial in the Brouwer group if and only if B is a norm from L. Okay, and if we rearrange this equation, I could write this as BY squared equals Z squared minus AX squared. So then you would see as long as your solution did not have uh, Y being zero, then this would have a solution if and only if B is a norm from k adjoined square root a down to k. And what do we know about conics? Well, as soon as a conic has a rational point, then it's isomorphic to p1. So the smallest number of points it can have is 3. In particular, you will always have a point where y is non-zero. So this conic having a solution is equivalent to b being a norm from k adjoint square root of a. Okay, that's really small. But it's the same as this. Okay. So this quaternion algebra, we can actually think of as a cyclic algebra because any cyclic quadratic cyclic extension of k is just obtained by adjoining the square root of a, as long as the characteristic is not 2. And um, this is the same, so this is the same as the notation. Uh, the Galois element, square root A goes to minus square root A, comma B. Okay? So this is a generalization of that. Any questions? Um, so, so what I'm going to say next is that um, what do you mean by is it known? 
if I take two algebras that I don't know if they're cyclic and I tensor them together, what do I? Just, um, you're saying, can I give you an isomorph? So, um, I haven't thought about considering arbitrary extensions, but, uh, but maybe if you give them really crazy groups. But I would say probably you could um, find an abstract isomorphism, but you would not actually know what it is. So, I mean, you would know that there, you could maybe hope to show that there is one in complete generality, but figuring out when, yeah, for an arbitrary field, figuring out when, even just when something maps to zero under the isomorphism is pretty hard. Okay, so, but in a different direction, even though um, not every element is cyclic, so a amazing theorem of Mercuriev and Suslin, oh, I think I'm spelling this wrong. Oh, I think I didn't write this in my notes. Which the, said, what do I want? Oh, the vowels. I thought you said the L's. It's like I don't even have any L's. I'm really off. Okay, so what this, what their theorem says that if K contains the, um, say it contains the nth roots of unity, then the n torsion is generated by these cyclic algebras. So you take, you allow any gener generator, which is cyclic, of degree n, uh, and you take any element in B, then it's generated by this. But you don't get to fix the extension for which it's cyclic. Okay, so even though we know that as long as you have the nth roots of unity, then you can take um, just tensor products of these, and that will be equal to any given element of the Brouwer group. Again, we don't really know how to simplify the presentation. Okay. All right. So uh, let me do, now switch to some examples where we have special fields. Okay, so everything I said so far works for a general field, maybe with assumptions on, oh, here I also want n prime to the characteristic. Yes, yeah. Okay, so this is from class field theory. So if K is a non-Archimedean local field, then we have a canonical isomorphism from the Brouwer group of K to Q mod Z. So we completely understand um, what the Brouwer group is. I mean, we get arbitrarily high torsion, but it's pretty nice for each n. We just get a cyclic group of order n. And the map is maybe, uh, takes a little bit of machinery to describe in complete generality, but if L over K is cyclic and unramified, and sigma is a generator, that um, when you take the reduction, say sigma bar is equal to the Frobenius endomorphism, then the invariant map of sigma b, cyclic of degree n, this is just equal to the valuation of b. Oh, I guess I don't even need that because I was going to. 
いですよ。So here we have a very nice description of what the isomorphism is, as long as you're considering cyclic algebras for unramified expansions. Yeah? Yes, it hits um, that everything in the Brouwer group can be written as a cyclic algebra. Yes. Yeah. Here we don't even need to take tensor products. We just, if you take a cyclic algebra by itself, it will generate, uh, generate the Brouwer group of the local field. Okay, so this is pretty nice. So that's what happens when you have a local field. Now what if K is a global field? So then the Brouwer group of K is much more complicated, but we still have a very nice description of it. This is the fundamental exact sequence of global class field theory. So the Brouwer group of K, you can embed diagonally into the Brouwer group of every completion. And you can show that this actually lands in the direct sum. So capital omega K is the set of all places of K. Okay, well, I guess you don't know that you just know that you can map it in diagonally, but then we can prove that it lands in the direct sum and also that it's an injection. Okay, that's pretty hard to prove that it's an injection. And then if we take the sum of all of these invariant maps and map to Q mod Z, and this is an exact sequence. Okay, and I just have to tell you, so Brouwer R, the invariant map, just the unique isomorphism with one half Z mod Z, and Brouwer C, well that's trivial, so it just goes to the trivial element in Q mod Z. So this is, uh, one of the original local to global statements that if you have a Brouwer class that's trivial in every completion, then it is trivial over the global field. Okay, so that's a very nice statement. And so um, yeah, and if you write down your element of the Brouwer group, well, if you write it down for a cyclic extension, you can easily compute this invariant map for all ones where it's all places where the extension is unramified, and then for ramified extensions, we have to do a little bit more work. But we can still, this gives us a pretty good understanding of the Brouwer group of K. Okay, so how does this relate to um, the example I was doing at the beginning? Well, the Brouwer group of K is how I, Instead of thinking of quadratic reciprocity, I just want to think of this sequence really just being a complex. So this sequence, this encodes quadratic reciprocity. Okay, so let's take the uh, quaternion algebra given by PQ. primes. So this is an element in the Brouwer group of Q. And since this map is a complex, that tells you that the sum of the invariants of PQ minus 1, that this has to be 0. And uh, well, by Unwinding this map, one thing that you can see is that the invariant map is trivial as long as V does not divide P or Q or 2. So just immediately from this definition, we're going to get that this is, um, this is non-trivial. So you're just computing the invariant at P, at Q, and at 2. 
And if you actually run through what it is, it will give you the fact that this is zero is exactly equivalent to the statement of quadratic reciprocity. So this encodes the statement of quadratic reciprocity. And you can also get the formulas for the Legendre symbol for minus one and for two by doing this lambda. So here I should have said odd primes. Okay. So I no longer want to think of quadratic reciprocity on its own. I just want to think of quadratic reciprocity as an, ex as an example consequence of this exact sequence. Okay. So, but this is the Brouwer group of a field. And what I said at the very beginning was that we want a way to encode something about the variety, right? We want to know how, uh, so given, let me put this here. We want to know something about the equations of the curve, why exactly we could use quadratic reciprocity and why it was quadratic reciprocity with 17 and odd primes, how did that come up? So we want, what we want to do is globalize this notion of the Brouwer group to, in an algebraic geometry sense, so to a ring or to a field. Um, so I am not going to be able to do that in the next 10 minutes, but luckily Claude Tillen also needs this for his lecture. So he's going to talk about the Brouwer group of, um, a scheme, but let me just first give some tools that will be useful. So I'm going to let K be a field. I'm, you, I don't know if you can tell, but I'm switching to capital K because I want to think of little k as being my field of constants and this capital K is maybe being some function field. But really this works for any field, but that's the context in which I'm going to use it. And let's take a discrete valuation on k and let n be an integer invertible in the residue field. So fv is going to be the residue field of v. Okay, so I'm just going to define this map and then later you'll see why it's useful. But I want to just talk about it and how we compute it. So there's something called a residue map at v at V. I'm going to denote it partial sub V. Goes from the n torsion of Brouwer K to H1 of the Galois group of the residue field. So I guess here I can do 1 over n z mod z. Okay, such that, so this is going to have the property that if you figure out what the right notion of Brouwer group of a ring or a scheme is, then the kernel of this map will be exactly the Brouwer group of the ring, and what ring? The evaluation ring of this field. Okay, so I haven't defined what this is, but just think of some way to globalize this definition that I gave you before. Okay, so, um, so in general, this is, uh, hard to compute, but for cyclic algebras, for certain cyclic algebras, then we can compute this. So if L over K is unramified at V, uh, and say L over K is a prime P, then capital K. The cyclic algebra is in the kernel if and only if either V splits completely in L or the valuation of V is congruent to zero mod P. So for cyclic algebras, we know how to compute. Uh, oh, 
Yeah. So what I mean here is you just take any generator, because this is um, this is a group homomorphism. So if I switch, if I pick, say, th this statement is independent of the choice of generator. Okay, so that's why I just wrote L over K instead of sigma, because it's really something about the subgroup generated by this cyclic algebra and the subgroup generated by it is independent of the generator. Okay, so um, yeah. So how does this relate to what we did before? Well, really what was happening, so we're going to see this a little bit more next time, is, let's go back to C, there we go, which was 2y squared equals x to the fourth minus 17z to the fourth. Oh, actually, I want to think of this the other way. Okay, 2y squared equals w squared minus 17. c squared, cw equals x squared. So what I can consider is the algebra 17x over y. So this is a quaternion algebra in the function field of g. Okay, and what you can check is uh, that for all discrete valuations, uh, on K of C, oh, in Brouwer K of C, thank you. So this is, the residue map is trivial, and we'll see why that's useful in a minute. And so now we can rephrase our argument. I'm just going to sketch it, but the whole argument is in my notes. So, um, so let's assume that x, y, c, w is a q rational point of c. So then you can check that uh, definitely if this is a rational point, all coordinates are non-zero. So we can think of the quaternion algebra 17 x naught over y naught. And notice, uh oh, I think I switched my coefficient. Yes, this is supposed to be W, W naught over Z naught. Notice that W, W naught Z naught over Y naught squared, this is equal to X naught over Y naught squared. So it's a square, in particular it's a norm. So this is going to be the same algebra as Z naught over Y naught. And if you just compute the sum of the invariants, so the quadratic reciprocity argument we did is equivalent to computing the sum of these invariants. And what you can prove is that this is one half, which contradicts our fundamental exact sequence. There. It's supposed to be a complex. Right, so this is an algebra in the Brouwer group of Q and I took the sum of the invariants, and I got a one half. Okay, so this is a little bit. Uh, I did not go into detail, also because I didn't define anything. Yes. Oh uh, yes, thank you. 
yeah, hopefully. I think I switched my variable names in the middle, which is always dangerous. Um, yeah, so what's really happening is that we were getting this element in the Brouwer group of the function field. This is how it was, the argument was depending on the variety with this nice property that this is true. And then we were using that to, okay, say if we had a rational point, I'm just going to plug in the coordinates and then it would contradict this fundamental exact sequence. Okay, so this is, this is a rephrasing of the first argument, which now I see how the argument is depending on my curve C very explicitly. Okay, so my second lecture, I will go into much more detail about how this works and why it works and why these properties are important. Okay, thank you. <laughs>